Here we go. All right. Let me uh, stop that and uh, wish everybody a uh, Good morning, good evening, good afternoon around the world. This is Martin Hubel, your host of the DB2 Night Show. Uh, today is our 130th show on DB2 for Z. And uh, believe it or not, we have a, a first time presenter with us, but uh, Robert is very well known to almost everybody in the DB2 community if you haven't been living under a rock. And uh, we're really pleased to have Robert with us today. How are you doing today, Robert? Doing well, thank you. Good. Good. All right. So let me get through the uh, all the announcements and stuff like that and a couple of audience polls, and we'll carry on and get through the show. We're having these this show a little earlier in the month because we have IDUG next week in uh, starting next week in uh, Edinburgh, and the following week, of course, is the conference itself. But uh, uh, due to a scheduling uh, uh, thing, they had to really start the the uh, uh, conference on the Saturday rather than on the Sunday for the uh, uh, for the workshops and that sort of thing. So it kind of messes up two weeks in in my life, but uh, it's kind of okay. But and we're certainly looking forward to being in Edinburgh. There's uh, one of my favorite cities on the whole planet. It's just a great time. So with that in mind, uh, we're wrapping the show up or having the show a little earlier in the month. So. Uh, once again, our social media page, uh, hashtag DB2Night on Twitter, will get you uh, news on the show. I, I strongly recommend that you follow that if you're interested in the night show. And, of course, we now have our uh, replays on YouTube, and, of course, we, and we announce those on uh, Twitter uh, using the hashtag DB2Night, in addition to our regular uh, replay blog where you can find out more information and download the uh Windows Media Format or the MP4, in addition to uh, grabbing a copy of uh, Robert's slides, which I have to put up uh, later on today. So here's our famous disclaimer. It wouldn't be a DB2 presentation from any vendor if we didn't have a disclaimer. Usual things here of uh, uh, use the information at your own risk. It's being recorded. Be nice. And we respect people's copyrights. So our other announcements are upcoming shows. Next uh, month on the LUW side, we have Les King of the IBM Toronto Lab talking about D DB2 warehouse reference architectures. Ooh, that sounds really impressive. And uh, following that, we'll have uh, Kerry Romanoff speak on DB2 11.5.8, the, the next point release they're having on DB2 11.5. The next show on the Z side will be Catherine Suhu of IBM in the Silicon Valley Lab talking about the uh, DB2 for Z application development experience. And that'll be on November 18th, uh, just prior to Thanksgiving week. And uh, we'll find a, a good presenter for December the 9th coming up. But that's the date if you'd like to mark your calendar. Once again, a little earlier in the month because of uh, the holiday period. As always, our founding sponsor of the DB2 Night Show is DBI Software. We thank them for the use of the platform, or as we would say in the old days, thanks for the use of the hall. Uh, but we also like to uh, remind people that they do have uh, great tools for DB2 LUW performance, and you can see that on their website by following this link. And I think if you watch the whole demo, you get yourself a Starbucks gift card. And they did have a new release out recently. Our winner... From last month is Jackie Chan of Cigna. Uh, he gets an Amazon gift certificate for watching. Congratulations, Jackie. And our sponsors, uh, yours truly and DBI, as mentioned earlier. Uh, oh, and here's my, my cartoon for this month. Uh, I think I've, I mentioned that we've adopted two new rescue chihuahuas. They came up from the Texas Chihuahua Rescue. Uh, there's a Can Canadian chapter to take them in and distribute them through the Toronto area. And actually, my daughter's a foster, and she has had them go as far away as Thunder Bay to the west, which is way up on the top of Lake Superior at the west end. And another one that went all the way up to St. John's, Newfoundland, about as far east as you can possibly go on the North American continent. But the one thing that you learn about Chihuahuas is they're not really all that interested in getting trained. So here we have the various poses of the results of training uh, Chihuahua. Sit, 
sit down, shake, etc., uh, roll over, result in the uh, poses you see here, uh, fetching, it doesn't work, come and stay. Now uh, they're also problematic. They're getting better at things around here. Uh, what they are really good at is cuddles and kisses and all that other good stuff that you get when you're with that small companion dog. So we're enjoying the heck out of them. Now, before we get on to you, Robert, let me just ask a couple of our polling questions here that we set up. The first one we're going to do is the standard what release are people currently on? And uh, that poll should be going out and people should be answering that and are as we watch the progress here. And good news, out of all the people that have voted so far, we're getting uh, the entire audience is on DB212. So we'll share that. A couple are, are fairly new to it by the looks of it. They're on function level uh, 100 or 500. We have an awful lot of people up at 508 and higher, though. That's great news. So we'll hide that and do the other question re, uh, that we do with uh, uh, new version presentations. What's your time frame to moving to DB213? Uh, made this one rather simple. We're getting people voting on that. And, uh, interesting responses. I'll give people just a few more seconds to give that a bit of a think. And we'll turn that uh, turn that off and we'll share the results. Looks like we got one or two people that are moving uh, quickly and the rest will be looking towards next year or the end of 2024. And of course, some people might be interested in the features, but they don't know the uh, to, uh, implementation schedule. So with that, I'll hide that and go back to my screen. And uh, what I'll do now is uh, turn this over to you, Robert. Uh, once again, that presenter thing should be popping up on your screen. Indeed it has. And uh, let me see if I can go to full screen mode here. And I hope that works. It looks great. Now, what I'm going to do, Robert, there's a, a tool we have called, well, it's a question tool. People know to type their questions in on, on the Q&A tool. You type, uh, the uh, attendees will type in there, and I'll be watching that queue for you, and I'll break in if they're uh, at an appropriate time, or I'll get your attention and ask the question as we go along to make the session a little more interactive, if that's all right. Very good. Good. So take it away, and uh, and here we go. Okay. Thanks, Martin. All right. And it's a pleasure to be with you folks today. And um, I'm going to provide in this presentation uh, some technical information about DB213 for ZOS. Uh, this slide just shows the uh, organization of content in the presentation. Um, I won't take the time to read through this list. I'll just go right on into it. Uh, so this slide just shows, uh, certainly not going to read every word on this one, but it just shows a little bit of, of where we've been and, and where we are and where we're going. So yeah, DB212 became generally available in October 2016. It was um, uh, marked the beginning of uh, a new way for DVD or ZOS development to get functionality out to users, uh, referred to as continuous delivery. And so we had uh, quite a number of function levels, um, <clears throat> and the last of those being uh, 510. And um, DB211 went out of service uh, in the spring of 2021. And um, uh, we have not even announced an end of service date for DB212, so no, no worries about that anytime soon. And DB213 uh, became generally available in the spring of this year. Uh, and the first function, new function level for 13 is expected before the end of this calendar year. That will be 502 um, because DB213, when you ordered it, even on the first day of availability, it came with uh, functionality up through function level 501. So the first new function level that will come out in the service stream will be 502, which is expected before the end of this year. 
And it's expected that there will be three function levels for DBD13 that will come out in 2023. Um, it was no accident that DBD13 for ZOS and the Z16, the new mainframe model, were announced on the same date and became generally available on the same date. We uh, in IBM speak often, often of the value of what we call the Z stack, particularly where ZOS is concerned. It's, it's our um, hardware, it's our operating system with DB2, it's our database management system. And, and that stack gives us great flexibility as to where we'll put various enhancements in hardware, microcode operating system, DBMS, and, and to do that so it will be most advantageous for people who use uh, DB2 and, and other software on this stack. And, and so there's a lot of synergy and, all, and long has been between DB2 for ZOS and Z and ZOS. And that continues. So uh, installation and migration has been simplified with DB2 13. One of the ways that was done was removal of Z parts. So this is something that really got started in earnest with DB2.12, a couple of DB2.12 APARs, removed several ZPARMs that continues with DB2.13, and we'll probably, we'll probably see more of this. There are still more ZPARMs than the development team wants, and, and so uh, they're gradually getting rid of those, and basically what they do is they'll look at a certain ZPARM and determine, okay, there's just no reason for this particular ZPARM to have anything other uh, than this particular value. And so they'll just remove the ZPARM and set it to that value internally. So they've done a good bit of that with EV213, more of that's likely to come. Uh, migration 213, <coughs> excuse me, will be possible from DB212 only when function level 510 has been successfully activated on that DB212 system. 510 doesn't deliver any new functionality, that version 12 function level simply exists to verify that this DB212 system is ready for migration to DB213. Uh, when you first migrate to DB213, your first function level, no surprise here, will be 100. Analogous to back in the DB211 days, what we called conversion mode, there are no new what we call external features available. Um, at that level, meaning basically the application programs and the people using the system. It looks like a um, functionally like a DBD12 system. There are no SQL, new SQL statements, no new SQL syntax, no new commands. You do get with function level 100 what you always have gotten at that initial level of a new version, which is you have optimizer enhancements. So yeah, if you bind or rebind packages, at the 100 level of version 13, you'll get optimizer enhancements. Um, the one interesting thing about um, the catalog when it comes to migrating to DBG 13, and I, I don't recall, I don't know if this has ever been true before. So as has always been the case, before you migrate from DBG 12 to DBG 13, you run a catmate job, the catmate utility, uh, to make the catalog ready for the new version of DB2. What's different is that this initial DB213 uh, catmate job will make no structural changes to the catalog. No new catalog tables, no new columns for existing tables, no changes of any columns, no structural changes whatsoever. Instead, it simply updates some control information. One nice thing about that is um, because structurally the DB213 catalog looks just like the, the DB212 catalog, that means that the so-called fallback SPE, short for small programming enhancement, that's a strange term, it, it's a, a, a sort of a legacy term, right? The fallback SPE is what uh, enables fallback. If you fall back from version N to N minus one, uh, it means that the uh, N minus uh, one code can handle the version N catalog. Well, the fallback SVE code uh, is much simpler this time around because catalog, again, is structurally identical. Uh, and that's a good thing for code quality and stability and all that. 
Um, when you go to version, uh, folks level 500 in the version 13 environment, again, the catalog will stay the same. The catalog will be at the 100 level. There is no 500 catalog level. Uh, you'll get some quite a number of new features and functions. Once you have activated 500, you can then execute catmate uh, with a specification of update level V13 R1M501. That will take the catalog at 501 level. Uh, that is when we first make structural changes, some of which I'll discuss. And then you can activate function level 501 and you get yet more new features. Um, so here is the first of a number of changes related to availability and scalability. And this is actually the largest section of this presentation. Uh, so that was a, uh, you can see that that was a major, major focus of the development team, availability and scalability. So uh, availability, right? Um, we've long since gotten past this idea of, oh, well, you know, availability is equivalent to db z os being up. Well, sure, that's important. Uh, but, but, you know, db z os has had, and ZOS itself, of course, and Z, have all had tremendous uptime for a long, long time. So the focus has been on, well, what else can we do to improve availability? Where well, there are plenty of things that impact availability, even if db z os is up, and here's one of them. So when you alter a table, right, almost invariably, that's going to cause um, invalidation of dependent packages. Well, not only that, but because of that, right, the alter contends with packages that uh, have a dependency on the table being altered. And if, especially if it's a package that's executed with a lot of, with great frequency, there's a very good chance that alter will time out. Uh, and that could be really problematic. And, and so, what uh, the DVD 13 development team did, and this available with, right, the initial functionality of, of 13 is, is, okay, they took one of those alters, specifically, which is alter table data capture changes, and you would execute that to uh, have DVD start logging uh, changes to the table to a greater degree for, generally for replication purposes. And, and as you can see at the table at the bottom, so like in a DP12 environment, uh, with tests with a dependent package running with, you know, a high degree of frequency, that alter table data capture changes command would either fail nine out of 10 times or 10 out of 10 times. And with a DP13 functionality, it succeeded every single time because it wasn't contending with these packages. And you might say as a DBA, well, that's great if I executed the command alter table data capture changes frequently, which I don't. Uh, it, it's other alter table um, statements that I'm most likely to, much more likely to execute. That's understood. So view this not as the end of the story, but as the beginning of the story. I can tell you for a fact that, that this is viewed by the development team as a journey. This is an important first step. They've shown it can be done. And um, probably with upcoming DVD 13 <clears throat> function levels, we're going to see more um, alter table uh, statements, different alter table options that can be executed without contending with packages. So uh, we'll see success for those where maybe we saw failure in the past. That's helpful. Uh, also in the area of scalability and availability, mostly scalability, um, online conversion from partition by growth to partition by range. So this uh, is, is a really big deal at a number of sites. Uh, they're really looking forward to exploiting this feature, and here's why. So partition by growth, right, which was introduced with partition, partition by range back with DB2.9, when we introduced universal table spaces. Well, partition by growth instantly appealed to a lot of DBAs for its ease of use. It, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to set up. You don't have to worry about, well, what partitioning key am I going to use? How many partitions should I have? Uh, what will be the limit key for each partition? That that's, could be a good bit of work. And then you need to monitor that. Well, do I need to maybe add a new partition? Do I need to adjust a partition limit key? Whereas PBG, partition my growth, by contrast, is so easy to set up. You just say, well, here's my data set size and, you know, my partition size, and um, here's how many partitions uh, I want to have at this time, a limit for this table. Boom, you're done. 
And you might check it another, you know, a year or two later to say, well, do I need to bump up Max Partition City? So easy. Well, the problem is a PBT table uh, space, of course, can get very large. Uh, it could be hundreds of millions, billions of rows, right? Um, and, and the bigger the table gets, the more DBA might experience what you might call buyer's remorse, like, oh gosh, um, I really wish I'd made this a partition by range table space, because that does provide a number of advantages related to availability, scalability, throughput, performance, um, utility access, application access, and these advantages are more pronounced the larger the table is. Well, also, the larger the table is, the harder it is, historically, has been to go from PPG to PBR because prior to DVD 13, how could you do it? Well, you had to unload the PPG table space, drop it, recreate as PBR, and reload it. And that was simply not feasible for a great big table. That meant too much of an average. Uh, and, and so there's a real problem. Well, with version 13 and function level 500 activated, there's a new clause for altered table, which is altered partitioning. And so you issue altered table with altered partitioning, you specify the partition by range, uh, spec you know, specifications there, and this is a pending change. Uh, then you run an online reorg of the table space, and coming out of that online reorg, now that table's in a partition by range table space. And it is immediately available for use uh, coming out of that online reorg. And, and so this is something that uh, a lot of DBAs, especially with great big PBT tables, really, really want. Uh, you'll see at the, the bottom uh, bullet item, indicates that initially uh, this is not supported for a PBG table that has either a lob or an XML column. Um, that is a known uh, requirement in terms of enhancements. The development team decided, okay, look, we've got the functionality ready to go for tables that lack lob and XML columns, and that covers a lot of tables. Let's get that out there, there and then we'll enhance it further with that uh, additional functionality. Um, also in the uh, area of availability scalability, well, log data sets. We got the ability with DB29 for ZOS to dynamically add a log, uh, active log data set, or more likely a pair of active log data sets. Okay. With DB213, we get the ability to dynamically remove active log data sets. And, and where is that particularly helpful? Um, well, when you want to replace active log data sets without having to take DB2 down to run the change log inventory utility. When, when might, you know, why would you perhaps want to replace active log data sets? Couple scenarios. One is to make them bigger. So prior to DB2 12, an active log data set size maxed out at four gigabytes. With DB2 12, um, once you've activated function level 500, one active log data set can be sized up to, I think, 768 gigabytes, enormously bigger than before. And, and that's actually important at some size. They'll have huge rates of inserts, some that's involving maybe uh, rows with lob values that themselves can be very big. And, and you'd be amazed at, at how the volume of data being written to the active log at some of these sites and how quickly they can wrap through the, the quote unquote circle of, of active log data sets. And so with this ability to dynamically add and remove, you can dynamically add some big active log data sets and then dynamically remove the little ones. And now with no disruption in DB2, you have big ones. Second use case, encryption of active log data sets. A lot of people know that starting with function level 502 of DB2.12, it became much easier to use the data set encryption feature of DB2.12 for DB2 data sets, for uh, um, you know, table space and index data sets, including catalog directory, uh, archive log data sets when you archive the disk, but not active log data sets. Because uh, you have to, to, to encrypt an active log data set, you have to create it with an encryption key specified. Um, okay, you can add new encrypted <coughs> active log data sets, but what about the old unencrypted ones? Now we can dynamically remove those, so that's helpful. Um, also for scalability, two directory 
objects. SVT01 for packages is just log range checks, uh, which keeps track of when uh, uh, data sets are open for read, write, and when they're not. Um, <coughs> pardon me, at some sites, uh, there was concern that the 64 gigabyte size limit for those table space spaces was not enough. So with DBD 13, they go to from 64 to 256 gigabytes. It's still PBG max partitions one. Uh, <clears throat> this is not some sort of required change. The way it works is uh, <coughs> the first time that you run uh, um, an, an online reorg of either <clears throat> SBT01 or syslog range X, once you have activated function level 500, <clears throat> The first time you do an online reorg of the, either of those coming out of that, they'll have that 256 gig, <coughs> sorry, data set size, and that's good for scalability of those objects. Uh, <clears throat> all right, and, you know, SVT01 in particular, a lot of people have a lot more packages and versions of packages than they used to have. Okay, um, more on scalability, more open data sets. What limited open data sets, right? Why, why do we have a limit on open data sets you know, for DB2 or ZOS in the first place, it's a virtual storage thing, particularly below the two gigabyte bar virtual storage. And you see in the, um, uh, near the middle of the slide, reference to a couple of DB212 APARs that help with this situation, helped us live within the DS max limit we have with DB212. Okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> but with, uh, that was still not enough. Well, here we benefit from uh, a change in ZOS 2.5. There's that Z stack I mentioned. So ZOS made a change so that, right, uh, open data sets simply require less virtual storage. And DB2, like other subsystems, can take advantage of that. And DB2.13 does. Uh, sort of a little near the bottom, it's noted that if you want even more relief here, uh, the, the scheduler work block um, blocks, uh, there's a, a change you can make to, to put those above the two gigabyte bar as well. But in either case, <clears throat> with DB213, DS max doubles. It used to be 200,000 for DB2 subsystem, now it's 400,000. Okay, now, as was true with the 200,000 DB212 limit, it, it's what you might call a theoretical limit. Uh, could you actually have 200,000 data sets open and allocated to a DBD12 system at one time? Probably not. Uh, you, most sites did not have enough virtual storage below the two gigabyte bar to accommodate that. Similarly, uh, not likely that you could actually have 400,000 open data sets. Uh, but here's the thing, the effective data set limit has pretty much been doubled. So a lot of organizations have found, right? It's been generally seen that in a DBD12 environment, uh, having, say, between 70 and 80,000, uh, a DS max value of, of 70 to 80,000, and actually hitting that, uh, well, yeah, was not a problem, right? You, that, that that was not a problem from a virtual storage uh, point of view. And it's not like you couldn't go higher. It's just if you wanted to, we'd want to examine, okay, how much virtual storage do you have and a cushion to go higher? Well, similarly, just as 70 to 80,000 um, was generally not a problem for a DBD12 site, uh, double that probably the 140 to 160,000 should be fine uh, for the majority of DB213 sites. So a doubling of the effective uh, DS max limit. Still on available in the scalability, virtual storage constraint relief. So um, we got some relief there that let us have more open data sets. Uh, <clears throat> more um, in, in this area, um, some related to ECSA, the extended common storage area. Because it's common, that's an important resource. And, and you know, if ECSA happens to fill up, whether it's DB2 or some other user of it, that causes it to fill up. Well, we spill over to CSA, that's below the line. And if that fills up, the ZOSL bar can come down. Uh, so whatever DB2 can do to um, relieve pressure on ECSA is just good for the ZOS environment in general. So uh, ways DVD-13 help there. One is with tracing. So just for that, we're gonna give you back about 25 meg of ECSA space just for tracing. Uh, um, more important in a lot of sites, um, 
added number of sites, especially if you have more than one production DVD subsystem and one ZOS LPAR, uh, and if they've got a big DDF workload, um, the space virtual storage requirement in ECSA required for DDF threads, DVAPs. Now, that was a real contributor to ECSA usage. That footprint is substantially reduced in DVD 13. <clears throat> also, in the area of virtual storage with sweet relief, while prepared dynamic statements have been cached above the two gigabyte bar uh, ever since DVD 8 for ZOS, the actual statement text uh, was not above the two gigabyte bar, and some SQL statements are pretty lengthy. That gets moved above the bar in DVD 13. Um, bind, rebind, prepare operations, use less virtual storage. Uh, also, um, when it mentions here contraction um, of, of thread related ECSA, this is, is mostly <clears throat> related to DDF workloads. Uh, more on this to come, but, but basically um, it, it relates to this scenario. Okay, so what if your max DBAT value is, for example, uh, 2000? And you're chugging along with about 200 DBATs because that's all you need for your workload. Uh, and then you get a great big surge of DDF transactions that takes max DBAT, you know, right up to about 2000 or so. And then that surge passes. Uh, okay, well, now we've got 2000 DBATs, you know, about 1800 or more of them in the pool, but we don't need that many DBATs in the pool. It's good for efficiency if we trim that down. Well, DVD 12 and prior versions did that trimming down, that right sizing of the DBAT pool uh, really more aggressively than it should have, would, would terminate uh, a whole lot of DBATs at once potentially that were sitting in the pool being unused. And that could put pressure on common storage. And, and so DVD 13 trims uh, the, the DBAT pool, right sizes it, um, in, in a way that puts a lot less pressure, still achieves the goal of right sizing it, but puts a lot less pressure on common storage. Um, oh, oh, and the last item here, um, one of the ZPARMs that was removed was real storage management. And, and that's <clears throat> because there's no longer any reason not to have that on. DB2 very efficiently and effectively can manage um, its real storage usage and release real storage when it doesn't need it. Um, and, and there's just no reason anymore not to have DB2 do that. And so that's now just gonna be on by default in DB2 13. Um, <clears throat> still on availability scalability. The real time statistics tables, a lot ever since we introduced those uh, several versions ago, a lot of uh, DB2 DBAs really like sys table space stats, sys index space stats, a lot of real useful information that's, you know, uh, uh, externalized regularly by DB2. But uh, some of those counters, uh, the data types were just too small. Think about, for example, number of inserts since last reorg. Well, at some sites, <clears throat> there's a very, very high rate of insert coupled with maybe uh, not, not a, uh, uh, a, you know, a, a, a too big, uh, you know, space of time between reorgs, it may be a certain table space just doesn't need to be reorged that often for whatever reason, right? Um, some of those counters could wrap because the data type was integer, which is up to about 2 billion, a little over 2 billion. And once that counter wraps, the value is therefore, after that's useless, it's meaningless. So for several of these counter columns, the data type went to a uh, big end for version 13. Um, that takes you up to nine quadrillion. Um, also, sometimes these uh, uh, real-time statistics table spaces can be um, accessed by a lot of processes and a lot of activity against them. They, like all catalog table spaces, they use row level locking. Uh, and every now and then it's possible it could get lock escalation. That was not good for concurrency. So for these two table spaces, we went to lock max zero. We just turned off lock escalation for them. Um, <clears throat> also related scalability, the ZPAR, page set page num. What's that? It says if you create a universal partition by range table space, 
what page numbering mechanism will it use? The old absolute page numbering or relative? That defaults to relative with version 13. Uh, the Delta team is very, very bullish on, on relative page numbering, strongly encouraging people to use it. Um, and and it, it provides number of advantages. It lets uh, um, a PBR table space get way bigger than it otherwise could. It gives you a tremendous um, improvement in, in management of partitions. Different partitions can have different data set sizes. If you alter the data set size for a given partition and make it larger, uh, it's an immediate change. You don't even have to do an online reorg of it. Um, you can have the number of partitions you can have for a PBR table uh, is not affected at all by the page size and the data set size. So just so many advantages. And the thing is to go from absolute to relative, you got to reorg the whole table space. And so we prefer that you not have to do that. So we're saying, yeah, with version 13, by default from the get-go, when you create a new PBR table space, it's going to use RPM, and that's what you should do. Uh, Ireland memory management, <clears throat> um, there's a Z farm that is still there called Mac storage for locks. Uh, okay, fine. That, that's input to the Ireland startup procedure. The problem was that could be overridden uh, on the job statement and that startup procedure outside of DB2, right? And, and you know, what if DB2 Sysprog makes the value X on a panel and one of his colleagues um, um, makes it Y uh, on the startup proc and, and then that's a, an, an unpleasant surprise for the system programmer first made the change. With version 13, um, that value in the startup proc uh, is no longer something that's specified in the job statement. It cannot be overridden outside of DB2. It can be overridden by a, um, uh, <clears throat> by, by a modify IRLM command, but that's within DB2. So it just avoids surprises in terms of the amount of storage that Ireland has to work with for locks. Um, another scalability uh, and availability change also related to locks. This in a uh, uh, data sharing environment. So in data sharing, um, a very important structure for DB2 is the lock structure. And there's a part of the lock structure called the lock list. And that's where we record X type global locks. And, and the thing is, well, what if you have some process, right, that's acting on group member pool dependent objects and it acquires, as sometimes is the case, a great many global X type locks. Okay, we record them on the lock list. What if we run out of space in the lock list? Oops. Uh, then processes are going to start getting, um, you know, resource unavailable um, error codes. They'll start failing. Oh, well, to avoid that, you can specify allow auto alt yes in the CFRM policy. We recommend that. The problem is the system, the operating system, is often just not responsive enough. Um, when we're filling up the lock list, it just doesn't notice that in time, and we fill it up. And people say, why did this happen? I had allow auto alt, yes, why didn't it get bigger? Uh, and, and I had a max value that would let it get bigger. So with version 13, it's IRLM that's going to monitor uh, the, the lock list usage. IRLM will detect that, okay, we're, we're getting a, a little too close to, to, to filling that up. IRLM then will take steps to make it bigger, and Ireland's going to do that in a more uh, aggressive way than the operating system would. So the hope there is that Locklist actually will get dynamically bigger when it needs to be, and, and that will happen fast enough to make a difference. Um, okay, last of the availability, scalability ones. Um, <clears throat> here, this refers to um, um, a, a set of new catalog tables. So when you take the catalog, the uh, catalog level 501, first time we make structural changes to the catalog, there will be some new catalog objects, although there won't yet be the associated data sets that are created with defined no, uh, which says they'll be used later. But check out the names, including sys pack statement depth. Hmm. So again, you think about packages getting invalidated as a result of alters and and that can be kind of a hassle, you know, getting those rebinds done, et cetera. Uh, and, hmm, but packages aren't necessarily monolithic, right? There's sections of packages. 
uh, and hmm, you know, might we instead of have having a package in its entirety dependent on a certain object, what if only a section of the package, what if uh, pertaining to a certain static SQL statement were dependent on this object? Hmm, what kind of flexibility would that give us in reducing contention between alters and packages? Uh, food for thought, but you can see that the development team is putting some pieces in place here to, again, help further address that contention between alters and uh, things like package and validation. Okay, <clears throat> performance. Uh, so some sites, this is not common, but some sites with a partition by growth table space in DVD-12 would see that a process doing inserts might have an insert fail and the reason code would say, well, it was full. And DBA might look at one or more partitions of this PBT table space and say, uh, no, there's some space in, in one or more of these partitions. Why did that happen? Well, the bottom line is it, it mainly was because when this happened, right? Need to do an insert, uh, clustering index says it ought to go in this page in this partition. And well, DB2 then requests what's called a conditional lock, which means, hey, if I can't get the, the IX lock that I need on this partition, right away, let me move on, try another one. And, and okay, so it would try other partitions and either couldn't get the conditional lock on those either, or might see that they're full. And it would wrap all the way around to the first one that tried to say, okay, can't do it. And might erroneously say um, full, even when that's not the case. With 13, Okay, same thing, we'll wrap around if we need to, trying to get these conditional locks or noting that partitions are full. But with 13, A, we're gonna do a better job of noting are these partitions actually full? And, and then also, if we wrap all the way around, we're gonna retry, I believe it's up to three, to try to get up to three of the conditional partition locks we couldn't get before on partitions. Highly likely that with one of those retries, we'll succeed and we'll drive the insert. And so <clears throat> less likely we're gonna get a failure because we just couldn't get a conditional lock because we're gonna do some retries. And if we actually see every single partition is full, we're not gonna fail with, with lack of space. We're gonna add a partition as we should do with a PBG. Um, the more efficient handling of DBAT threads, um, that's what I referred to earlier. When, it, when we right size trim down the DBAT pool, after it, it got really big because of a DDF transaction surge, we're going to do that in a way that's going to put less pressure on common storage in the COSL farm. Uh, internal block fetch. This is not DDF, DRDA block fetch. This is the you know, stage one part of, of DB2, which is the, the data manager, um, you know, passing rows to the stage two part of DB2, which is the relational data system. And, and it can do that in blocks, right? Uh, rather than a row at a time. Well, that, that's good, that's efficient, uh, good for efficiency. Well, with DVD 12, to get that, you know, uh, cursor's open, fetch, 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 and DVD 12 notices, oh, uh, okay, this many rows have been fetched, I'm gonna start using internal block fetch. DB 213 is going to learn about the behavior of various queries, and DB 213 will say, oh, I've seen this query before, and I know from having seen it before, and it doesn't take many executions of a query for DBD to learn this. <clears throat> Based on prior experience with this query, I know highly, highly likely it's, you know, the process is going to retrieve enough uh, result set rows to make internal block fetch beneficial. I'm going to start using that right from the beginning. So we get the, the benefit for those queries right away, rather than waiting until some threshold is reached. Um, uh, more intelligence, right? Had to do with index look aside. We got index look aside way back, like about db 213 or something. And I, I mean, I mean 2.3, I'm talking about 30, way back about 2.3. But it's always been like a, like a buying time decision, right? Based on catalog statistics. With version 13, it can be an execution time decision like, oh, db2 will notice a pattern of sequential access, this is usually gonna be most effective for batch processes. And DVD 13 can say, oh, um, I didn't initially choose index look aside for this process, but I'm going to, because I can see it would be helpful. Uh, and, and so that's a runtime decision that could be good for performance. Index fast reverse blocks, right? Introduced with version 12, 
Um, and so DB2 can build these in-memory structures from indexes and, and using them can substantially reduce get page activity for queries, um, and, and that's certainly good for efficiency. So with version 13, uh, we're doubling, we're making more indexes candidates for fast reverse blocks. Um, we're doubling the size of unique keys, um, almost, yeah, we're more than doubling the size uh, for non-unique keys, and, and because index look aside, uh, not only is the code um, very, very stable now, very high quality code, it's also just been seen to be a real winner uh, for performance. So we're, we're expanding the use of that. Uh, we got rid at the bottom of an index that's uh, extraneous on the syspat debt table. Uh, it's kind of a small thing, but hey, it's a little bit of CPU gain when it comes to in inserts into syspat debt. Why not get that efficiency gain if we can? Um, moral performance. So the if 306 log read, right? That's um, intended to uh, allow, and it's usually used by replication tools, such as, right, our uh, example is IBM Infosphere Data Replication, IIDR. So IIDR or a similar tool can issue these if 306 requests and get um, data changes from the DB2 log buffers, right? Very efficient. Well, what if you've got like a partition table, like a range partition table, for example, and, and uh, uh, it's big, a lot of activity, and maybe you say to uh, like IIDR, okay, I wanna get three concurrent replication streams going for this uh, uh, you know, table with 30 partitions, one for partitions one through 10, another for 11 through 20, another 21 through 30, okay, fine, but each one of those replication streams, um, the, the replication process is, is going to get, when it issues IPI 306, it's going to get changes related to all partitions and have to kind of filter those out. With version 13, you can specify a partition limit, a partition range, and then your, the result of your IPI 306 is going to return data changes pertaining only to those partitions. And that's going to make those more CPU efficient, reduce replication latency, et cetera. So that's positive. Um, Okay, uh, false lock intention in PBRs. Well, and I mentioned the development team, very, very bullish on PBR. Uh, want people to use it um, for R RPN. Uh, th that is very bullish on RPN, relative page numbering. Want people to use it for their PBR table spaces. There was a scenario uh, where it's a data sharing environment, number one. Number two, you've got lock size row specified for a PBR RPN table space, and you need a certain workload going, and in a you know, type of data change workload going, and the result could be um, higher levels of false global lock contention than we should have had, and that, that just adds to CPU overhead. So with version 13, uh, there's a new mapping mechanism for the uh, uh, global locks pertaining to row level locking for PPG RPN table spaces. We use that automatically for those created once you've activated function level 500 for existing PBR RPN table spaces. The first time you do an online reorg of the table space, it could be a partition at a time. First time you do an online reorg, uh, we'll use that new um, hatching algorithm for these locks, and, and that will reduce false contention. It's good for CPU efficiency. Uh, when you're using RACF to manage DB2 security, uh, we've got some enhancements that basically make um, in, improve the scalability and efficiency of checking for authorization to execute a plan. We already pretty much have these efficiencies for package um, authorization. We've extended those to plan authorization. Um, last of the performance uh, group of enhancements, um, for data sharing, um, cast out processing. So a group buffer pool, right? Um, we don't want to fill up, right? Um, and, and the way we avoid that is we cast out uh, to disk pages written to the group buffer pool. And so with version 13, we're going to do that more aggressively. We're going to check that GBP, GB pool T threshold instead of every 10 seconds. We're going to check it every second. So we're going to be more aggressive about seeing, do we need to cast out from this group buffer pool? 
also related to that, um, if it so happens that a group buffer pool it gets so full that we simply can't write a change page out to it, um, then we're going to, as we would in version 12, we'll retry uh, that, that GBP write, but we're going to do the retry uh, sooner after we tried the first time. And, and coupled with a more uh, frequent checking of that threshold and more aggressive passing out, that should mean that if you encounter uh, a group buffer pool write failure, the transaction that had to be held up will be held up for a shorter period of time. We're going to drive the retry faster and it should succeed. Um, sort. So the Z15 introduced <clears throat> a new instruction called sort L that uh, can benefit, <laughs> among other things, SQL sorts. And <clears throat> DB2.13 is, DB2.12 could use it. DB2.13 is going to expand use of it, again, through learning. Uh, DB2.13 is going to learn uh, about characteristics of various SQL sorts. And then when it sees a certain SQL sort again, it was, okay, I already know from prior experience, using sort L for this one is gonna be beneficial, so it will use it, more intelligence there. Recovery boost, this is something that actually applies to 12 and 13, pertains to Z16. It's a Z16 feature whereby if you have a, you know, ZOSLR fails and we do a restart, all the engines available to that LPAR can be engaged in the restart to get the restart done faster. DBD or ZOS participates in that. Um, SQL and application management, first SQL data insights, um, a really substantial, a significant new SQL feature, maybe the most significant going back a long time. SQL Data Insights, it's, we built basically machine learning into um, the DB2 engine for the first time. Um, and it's, it's leveraged through three new built-in functions, AI Analogy, AI Similarity, AI Semantic Cluster. Um, the use of this is zip offloadable. What does it let you do? Well, just to take one example, with AI similarity, <clears throat> I can say that and the query syntax is, is very simple. I can say, hey, DB2, uh, let's say I'm an insurance company, and here's a policyholder um, that is uh, committed fraudulent activity. And, and um, boy, it took our investigative team, our fraud, fraud analysis team, a long time to, to find out that Fred Smith uh, had been submitting fraudulent claims, and we finally did. Uh, golly, how many of the Fred Smiths might be out there submitting fraudulent claims? Well, I can submit a query with the AI similarity built-in function, and I specify Fred Smith's, you know, account ID, um, and all I'm asking is, hey, DB2, you know, look at this table uh, of my, uh, you know, policyholders, and, and find other rows that are like uh, Fred Smith's. And, and I don't have to say what I mean by like. The system will do that for me. Uh, and, and the way it does that, as you see in the upper right, um, the way this works is the DBA, uh, through an easy to use GUI interface, says, okay, uh, DB2, build a model for this table. Um, and, and it will, and it builds, sometimes we call it a model table, it's sometimes referred to as a vector table, and, and, what, and does that in the background. And what that table contains Basically, in machine learning speak, it's a learning document projected onto a relational table. Uh, and <clears throat> it's, a, it's a bunch of numbers. It's primary key values and a bunch of numbers. And, or, or I should say unique values from the table and a bunch of numbers. And, and the numbers in these vectors allow the use of these built-in functions where now, in a quite efficient way, we can find these similarities and even let you know through what you might call a similarity score numerically, um, we'll let you know which rows are most similar, say to Fred Smith. Uh, you could also say, well, you know, here are some of my best customers, uh, like semantic cluster. Here's a set of some of my best customers. Find me rows that are least like these, that are my least good. What can I do to maybe help make them good customers? Again, you don't have to say what least is. The system will find that, and it can uncover insights. Um, that, that you might have either not been able to uncover yourself at all, or it would have been very difficult. Now it's really, really easy. And this vector table, it's never referenced in a query, it's referenced the base table. 
in the background. DB2 uses the vector table to, to provide results for these quote unquote fuzzy queries, a really uh, very interesting new capability, lots of interesting use cases. Um, more on SQL. Um, we now have the ability with a new special register current lock timeout for an application to specify its own lock timeout value, because often the ZPARM, uh, which is global for the DVD subsystem, is, is not appropriate for all applications. Might be good for batch, but not for online or vice versa. Uh, with this special register, an application can specify its own lock timeout value. Uh, and we provide a ZPARM, a new ZPARM, and said, well, but in my, in this subsystem, it can't be higher than that. Uh, we also provide instrumentation that says, well, if lock time was hit and it was an application specified lock timeout, we're going to report that. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, uh, in a, this slide simply says, uh, sort of an FYI, okay, if you want to use this in a data sharing environment, and, and if you want to say, well, I want to take it down to one second uh, for this particular application, um, we may not be able to actually achieve that because uh, the information at the bottom of the slide indicates global lock timeout has something to do with the deadlock. It's a multiple, the deadlock time value, which itself can't be lower than one second. So, okay, less than a second in a data sharing environment, we might not actually be able to achieve, but Two or three seconds, that's, that's doable even in a data sharing environment. Uh, so application specific lock timeout. There's also a new application specific deadlock priority. What's this about? Well, right, what if there's a deadlock? And, and okay, DVD is gonna choose a winner and a loser, but you couldn't influence that. Um, and this particularly galled some DBAs when you said, well, look, I've got a must complete process it deadlocks with some application process and DB2 choosing me as a loser, I don't want that. And so DBA can say, okay, for this process, I'm gonna set deadlock resolution priority for me to 255, the highest it could be, which means, hey, DB2, if there's a deadlock, I win. Uh, and it could also maybe be for certain application processes that are like must complete. Now you'll notice this is a built-in global variable, not a special register. W what's the deal with that? Why the one and not the other? Well, Anybody can set a special register, global variable, you've got to have permission to use that. So we don't want just anybody to say, well, here's my deadlock priority, because then maybe everybody will say, oh, I'm going to make mine 255, and it's useless. Uh, so global variable requires permission. All right, both of these, application specified timeout and application specified um, uh, deadlock priority, can be set automatically for an application in version 13 with the profile tables. And not only that, but the profile tables, which previously could only be used with DDF using applications, like DRDA requester applications, now can be used for the purpose of, uh, among other things, setting these, this special register, this new built-in global variable for local to DB2 applications as well. Um, and at the bottom, uh, IPI 306, I've already mentioned that. It's like replication, get changes from the log buffers. Well, sometimes there's a table with rows in, encoded by an edit proc. And okay, if you're gonna replicate that, you gotta decode what was encoded by the edit proc. Well, strange though it may seem, uh, you know, what about uh, various vendors who, who use IPI 306 for replication purposes? Well, we didn't have a standard mechanism for getting edit proc decode, and believe it or not, uh, other replication vendors had to work directly with DBWZ OS development so they could get a mechanism for using it. That was just kind of ridiculous. Uh, so now we've got a standard mechanism for getting uh, edit proc decode, and so now replication vendors can simply use it instead of having to do these one-offs with DB2 development. This slide simply shows here the rules for default data set size for a PPG table space based on page size and number of partitions, right? And one thing you'll notice is if max partitions is 254 or lower, your data set size is going to be 4 gig regardless of page size. Okay, why am I telling you this? Because some of you might know that when a PPG table space was created implicitly by DB212, you were always going to get a four gig data set size, even though max partitions was 256. Uh, wait a second. Our rule says if max partitions is bigger than 255, 254, 
then data set size should depend on page size. So we were violating our own rule, which is goofy. So with version 13, it implicitly created uh, PPG table space will have the max partitions value of 254. So you'll always get a four gig data set size regardless of page size. So we're following our own rules as we should have. Uh, <clears throat> and then security, um, package ownership, believe it or not, um, if you and your environment uh, were using, making some use of role-based security as well as auth ID, it actually was not easy to tell DB2 like for a package, uh, whether it's bind or rebind package or create procedure, hard to tell DB2, hey, the owner of this package is an auth ID or it's a role. Um, with version 13, we can do that explicitly. We can just tell DB2, hey, uh, the owner of this package is a role. It is an auth ID. Same for create procedure. Uh, we couldn't do that explicitly before. Now it's easy. At the bottom, it simply says there's an IBM offering called the Z Security and Compliance Center, ZSCC, that just helps you validate that a Z environment is uh, in compliance with security requirements. DVD for ZOS participates in that. Um, then a little bit in insight and oversight. We, uh, with DVD 13, we report group buffer pool page residency time. And that can be really helpful. Like what if I've got coupling facility LPARs with some memory that I'm not using? And I'm thinking, hmm, okay, um, maybe I should make some group buffer pools bigger, uh, but which one should be bigger? Sure would be helpful if I knew which group buffer pools had a pretty low page residency time. Now I can get that information. Paid splits, well, Paid splits can be a real performance drag, throughput drag, especially for certain high insert processes. But our instrumentation in the past only sort of hinted at that. Uh, it was really hard to absolutely verify that, yep, paid split activity is a problem for this. Um, now, we instrument that um, in the standard statistics trace class three, which is typically always on, will report any time an index page split takes more than a second. Um, and, and so it takes unusually long. And so, all right, we've got it right out there. Also uh, in the index space stats, real time uh, statistics table, we've got several new counters which show you explicitly, yes, this is the amount of page split activity you're getting for this object. Now, much easier now to really verify, oh, index page split is a problem with this, uh, uh, object or process, I, I want to take some action to deal with that. Uh, also, uh, oversight, um, now with uh, uh, the standard accounting trace class three, we'll let you know what was the longest wait time for a lock or a latch or a sync or async or IO or a drain lock or service test. Again, um, because we report these averages, uh, well, with a lot of activity, it was really hard to tell, uh, you know, with, with the average values could really mask a situation in which a long, for example, latch weight uh, really negatively impacted a transaction. Now we're gonna get information that really lets us see, oh, by golly, yeah, boy, that was a long wait for a latch or a long wait for a service task switch or something. Um, stat time main, the ZParm on how frequently do we cut statistics trace records. Now it's every 10 seconds instead of every 60 that greater granularity is gonna make it more easy to zero in on performance issues with the standard statistics trace information. Um, the ITKID 369, that is aggregated accounting information at the connection type level for the KixDB2 workload, the DRDA workload, IMSDB2, um, call attach, et cetera. That could be really handy. We're not gonna include that. If you've got statistics trace class one and two on, and they're usually on all the time, and you generate a statistic that's like detail or long report, if your monitor supports this, we're gonna automatically include in that report this aggregated accounting information, and that can be very handy to have along with the statistics information. Uh, the catalog history table, I'm gonna talk about that in uh, just a second. <clears throat> and uh, at the bottom, it just shows now, um, if we got deadlock and timeout, um, situations involving an object with a name more than 16 bytes, we're going to include that in the message. Okay, the catalog table is wrapping up with this. This slide simply says that 
uh, in DVD-12 in the maintenance stream, we delivered a lot of utility-related enhancements. Well, with version 13, an important one there is this new utility history table in the catalog called Sys Utilities. There's a ZPARM associated with it. The default value is none. Don't use it. Don't read anything into that. That doesn't mean we're recommending you don't. Almost always, when we introduce a new ZPARM, the default behavior is, okay, don't change anything. That's just all that all this is. Um, we think they're going to like this very much. We recommend using it. Um, and so when you set that to utility, <clears throat> every time utility is executed, we're going to record who executed it, what was the utility, when was it executed, on which member like of a data sharing group, et cetera, information about elapsed time, how much time, CPU time was spent in sorting, for example, all kinds of useful information. Also, we're going to put in there an event ID value, which can be correlated with event ID and sys copy to get object level information. We're going to put that object level information, what was being reorged uh, or reorged or copied or whatever. What was the utility operating on? We're going to put that directly in the sys utilities uh, catalog table with a future function level, future catalog level. But initially, uh, you can correlate that to get it from sys copy. Um, also, reorg index performance. Uh, we, in version 13, we're just going to uh, eliminate use of, of sysut1 for a reorg, where we, we unload index values, index keys, into a, a physical data set, and then reload them back in for index build. We're just going to stop doing that. We're just going to pass those keys directly from the unload to the index build phase in memory. Huge improvement in elapsed and CPU time. Um, the, uh, at the bottom, <clears throat> um, it mentions that, what if you have a situation where I've got to do a full recovery of a, a partition table space, but all I have, this is not unusual, all I have are partition level backups, and you submit that full recovery job, and it fails, telling you, oh, sorry, to use uh, partition level backups, you've got to use a list app. Oh, doggone it. Um, now with version 13, you don't have to use a list app. You submit recover table space uh, for the full table space. It doesn't matter if all you have are partition level backups that will succeed without a list app. And I believe this is the last one before my thank you slide. Um, page sampling is uh, a CPU efficient and quite effective way to get pretty accurate catalog statistics, <clears throat> but page sampling was only available for the run stats utility itself, not for inline stats that you got with load and reorg. With version 13, you can get paid sampling for inline statistics. Um, the repair write log option. Well, um, our uh, IIDR replication tool, for example, has long tolerated uh, a rebuild of a compression dictionary and did miss a beat because uh, it could access the old compression dictionary for the sort of little bit of overlap time in the log uh, <clears throat> to decompress records that were written and compressed forward of the log. Um, well, what if another vendor has got like a, a reorg tool that, that has its own way of creating a new compression dictionary? Um, we didn't have a standard mechanism that that vendor could use to write a copy of the, the new compression dictionary to the log and subsequently access it. Now, again, we've got that standard mechanism. This is part of just taking care of the ecosystem. And that is really important, DVD over ZOS development. Yes, we compete with, with other vendors for DV2 tools. That's good for DV2 users. Competition is good for people who use DV2. And, and we want uh, other vendors at DV2 to, to uh, make it easy for them to write tools and work with DV2. This is just part of that story. Uh, and with that, I think I went a couple of minutes over. Sorry about that, about 10, actually. Appreciate <laughs> well, your patience never, with me. <laughs> it's but, never uh, a problem, uh, Robert. We always let people uh, uh, stay around. We don't encourage people to go past the quarter after the hour because uh, I find that people on the East Coast get hungry, and you just see people kind of drop out. But uh, that was a uh, great presentation. Uh, I got one question here for you. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, we are still actively creating multi-table table spaces. Our Apple Compat Z Parm is set to M508, but we do a set Apple Compat 503 before the creation of the objects. Will this uh -huh. function still be carried forward to version 13? And when will deprecated object creation no longer be available? Real good question. Uh, answer yes, still supported. 
and and so uh, and you're likely going to have that capability for a long, long time, because right, we're very much going to continue to allow you to uh, update the value in the current application compatibility special register. And, and you can always, for a dynamic SQL issuing program, which could be like Spoofy or DSN Tech 2 if you're a DBA, you can always go to a lower application compat level than, than what the package has. You can't go higher, but you can go lower. And so the question really then becomes, okay, uh, if I go to 503, then I can create, you know, a traditional uh, segmented table space that can accommodate multiple tables. Um, and so when will I not be able to go down as low as 503? Oh, boy. Uh, maybe some time in the very misty future, in a version 13 environment, you can still go down to, you can still do set current application compatibility equals V10R1. Uh, and people say, okay, but are you going to eventually say you can't go down to V10R1? Maybe. Uh, I haven't even heard a whisper uh, that, that we're going to do that. Now, it is, imagine that, okay, at some point at the development team, gets tired of supporting, I say gets tired, if they find it's taking too much resource to support V10R1 application compatibility, they'll, they'll say so and they'll give you a lot of advanced warning. Okay, that could happen someday. And then maybe someday even further in the future, they'll say, okay, we're gonna do the same thing with V11R1. Okay, maybe even further in the future, they'll say we're not gonna do that for certain low version 12, you know, early function levels, the point being, You'll be able to, to set that to V12 R1 M503 for a long, long, long time. So no worries about that at all. Great. That's good news. Thanks so much. And uh, okay, I'm gonna I've taken back control here. I'm going to okay. go to our final screen and I'm gonna ask our final polling question, which is always uh, good to know. It's rather simple and it's uh, did you learn anything? And we're finding that an awful lot of our audience has voted. Uh, they're all, and uh, I think we'll just shut that off right there and we'll share the result. And we find that 100% of our audience learned something today. This is always the number we're looking for seeing, and that's fantastic news. Yay. Yay. Yes, indeed. That's a big yay. Uh, back in the days of sound effects, I'd put one up, but um, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But uh, I'll just thank you again. Uh, I'll be posting uh, Robert's slides with the on the replay blog later today. So uh, look for those. And um, thanks all for attending. And we will see you next time on the DB Tonight Show. Cue the music. Nice. Very good. Here comes the music. And have a great weekend. And we'll see you all um, in November for the next DB Tonight Show on uh, DB2LUW. All the best. Okay, and, uh, stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Robert.